a vote of 50 to 48, the slimmest margin for any Supreme Court nominee in history. It's about damn time. In fact, it's long past time. Now, when Kavanaugh was nominated, I raised questions about just how originalist he would be. I actually preferred Amy Coney Barrett for his seat. But Kavanaugh was always well qualified. No one raised any significant objections regarding his judicial ability. In fact, Democrats opposed Kavanaugh specifically because they believe he will faithfully interpret the Constitution according to its original meaning. Their opposition morphed into a series of increasingly absurd attempts to destroy Kavanaugh's reputation. He bought too many Washington Nationals tickets. No, no, no. He was a sexual abuser. No, he was a drunk. No, no, no. He has anger management issues. No, no, no. He hates ice cubes. All of this was unprecedented, nasty, ugly. We've never seen anything quite like it before. But we will see something like this again every single time if the institutional left is allowed to regain power. This will become our regular politics. Our national life will be an unending series of smears backed with no evidence. Politics of pure evisceration practiced at an epic scale. But you know what? Maybe I'm being a little bit vague. So let's define the institutional left. Let's take a look at the smears and the smear artists. Let's begin with our friends in the Democratic Party. Senator Dianne Feinstein knew for weeks about charges from Christine Blasey Ford that Brett Kavanaugh sexually assaulted her some 36 years ago. Despite Ford's stated desire that those charges remain unknown, someone leaked those charges to the left-wing press. Feinstein then announced that she had referred the presence of sexual abuse allegations against Kavanaugh to the FBI. Four days later, Ford came forward. With zero corroborating evidence, not a single shred, Feinstein charged forward with her allegations. Democrats proclaimed that the allegations were a pure hashtag MeToo case, a case of a credible woman being ignored by Republicans. That was a lie. Republicans took Ford's charges seriously every step of the way, and Democrats impeded and delayed every step of the way, desperately hoping to stave off Kavanaugh's nomination beyond the midterms. They said Ford couldn't travel to Washington, D.C. They said they wanted an FBI investigation. They said that if Republicans did not call for an FBI investigation, it was because Kavanaugh was guilty. They said they didn't want to turn over Ford's psychiatric evidence. At no point did Democrats attempt to tell Ford's story in a forthright, honest way. Instead, they maligned Brett Kavanaugh to his face, then act surprised when Kavanaugh got upset at being labeled a gang rapist. They called him a perjurer and an abusive alcoholic. As it turns out, friends of Ford even contacted one of the alleged witnesses to the event and tried to pressure her to change her testimony. They did all of this to preserve a shot at the leftist 5-4 majority on the Supreme Court, an institution that was intended to interpret the law, not make it up. The Democrats should be ashamed of themselves, but since they have no shame, none will be forthcoming. But the unprecedented, ugly behavior of the Democrats couldn't have occurred in a vacuum. They required the help of an eager media infrastructure ready to report any uncorroborated allegation, hungry to destroy Brett Kavanaugh, obsessed with crafting narratives designed to turn an uncorroborated four-decade-old allegation into a polarizing war of the sexes. The Washington Post let it all off with a ridiculous story suggesting that Kavanaugh had, quote, piled up credit card debt on Nationals tickets. Then CBS News reported that Zena Bash, a former Kavanaugh law clerk, may have flashed a white power sign during Kavanaugh's hearing. Then, after Ford came forward with her allegations, the media really kicked into high gear. NBC News reported on an unverified Facebook post, a woman later deleted, backing Ford's claim. The New Yorker ran an uncorroborated allegation that Kavanaugh had exposed himself to a woman back at Yale. Then, the New Yorker followed up that crappy story with a second crappy story. They reported a secondhand witness who'd heard about Kavanaugh exposing himself, only to reveal that the person who supposedly told the Kavanaugh story to that secondhand witness had no memory of the Kavanaugh story. They ran with this story anyway. The entire media ran with Michael Avenatti's insane allegations regarding Julie Swetnick, who laughably alleged that Kavanaugh drugged the punch at parties in order to facilitate gang rape. The New York Times reported that Brett Kavanaugh threw ice cubes at someone at a bar some 33 years ago. Too many to count in the media falsely alleged that Kavanaugh perjured himself and began digging into whether a yearbook entry about boofing meant farting or anal sex. Worse than all the trigger-happy misreporting were the narrative lies put forth by the media. The Washington Post ran an entire column by Connie Chung suggesting that because someone who was not Brett Kavanaugh sexually assaulted Connie Chung, 
Kavanaugh probably assaulted Ford. USA Today ran an op-ed stating that Kavanaugh should be barred from coaching girls basketball. The New York Times ran a bevy of op-eds stating that because Kavanaugh was angry at being called a rapist, he was therefore unfit for the high court. And the media pushed the most absurd narrative of all. The narrative that believing in due process meant undermining hashtag me too. The lie here was that if we weren't willing to destroy Brett Kavanaugh's life based on Ford's uncorroborated allegations, that we didn't care about women. Believe all women, they shouted. But that isn't a standard of justice. It's not even a standard of logic. In fact, not even the media believe all women. They quickly moved away from even repeating Swetnick's allegations, for example. And that oft-repeated line that only 2% of sexual allegations are false, it's simply not based in verifiable statistic truth. It's actually insanely difficult to peg the actual rate of false sexual allegations because lots of allegations are true and criminal, some allegations are true but not criminal, some are unsupported by evidence, and some are actually false. The National Sexual Violence Resource Center classified 6% of sexual assault claims as false, but added that 45% of cases didn't proceed far enough for anyone to determine whether the claims were actually false. One 2009 study put the rate at 7.1% for false reports. FBI statistics from 1995 to 1997 placed the percent of unfounded forcible rape accusations at 8%. As Michelle Malkin notes, published research has documented false rape and sexual allegations ranging from 8% to 41%. All of these rates, by the way, are substantially higher than the combined rate of false allegations for all other crimes, 1.16%, according to a 2017 study. And here's the bottom line. The definition of due process is that no one should merely be believed. We can presume they're telling the truth, but then we have to verify the story. Nonetheless, by positing that Republicans inherently distrusted female accusers, the media hoped to stoke a war of the sexes. It backfired. Republicans have drawn even on the generic congressional ballot, and that's because there are still a hell of a lot of women in this country who aren't willing to watch their husbands, brothers, and sons destroyed by unverified and unverifiable allegations. But let's never forget the media's real agenda here. Not Me Too, but Stop Kavanaugh. The media wanted to stop Kavanaugh because they disagree with him politically. It's that simple. On Friday, Jim Acosta of CNN. And folks, find you someone who loves you like Jim Acosta loves him some Jim Acosta. He let the cat out of the bag just after Senator Susan Collins came out in favor of Kavanaugh. He tweeted, quote, with a single speech, Senator Collins announcing her support for Kavanaugh has paved the way for a much more conservative Supreme Court for the next generation. Abortion rights, gay rights, climate change, and health care reform could well be impacted for decades to come, unquote. That's the agenda. And let's not forget the astonishingly blatant hypocrisy of purportedly nonpartisan organizations in this debacle. Take the ACLU, a group dedicated to due process. They have never, ever come out against a judicial nominee. And they certainly haven't come out against a judicial nominee based on unverified allegations of criminal activity without due process. Well, they did this time. They came out against Kavanaugh, and then they dropped more than a million bucks on TV advertisements comparing Kavanaugh to Bill Clinton and Bill Cosby. Or take the American Bar Association, a supposedly nonpartisan organization. They gave Kavanaugh their highest rating until the president of the organization sent a letter to the Senate requesting a delay on Kavanaugh's vote until after an FBI investigation. Or there's the League of Women Voters, a supposedly nonpartisan group whose CEO, Virginia Case, got herself arrested protesting Kavanaugh, an arrest celebrated by the group itself. Academia chimed in, too. On October 4th, the New York Times carried an open letter to the Senate signed by 2,400 law professors across the United States dismissing the importance of due process and the presumption of innocence, and instead focusing in on Judge Kavanaugh's supposed, quote-unquote, lack of judicial temperament. Funny, I can't remember one of those professors objecting to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the notorious RBG, as they call her, calling President Trump a faker back in 2016 and calling for him to resign. These eminent law professors supposedly committed to open inquiry. They said they were actually upset that Kavanaugh reacted aggressively to questions about whether he was a gang rapist. Now, the real reason these professors opposed Kavanaugh is because they don't want Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court for ideological reasons. Our nation's law schools are bastions of hard left thought. These law schools churn out leftism. There's a reason that Elena Kagan was the dean of the Harvard Law School when I was there. There's a reason Elizabeth Warren taught property when I was there. In 2014, fully 98% of all political donations from Harvard Law faculty 
went to Democrats. Every single top law school in the country leans to the left, all of them. Here are some charts of ideological distributions among faculty at the top 14 law schools in the country from a 2016 study in the Journal of Legal Analysis. See how every one of these charts has a massive bump on the left-hand side of your screen? That would be all the self-identified leftists. So why were all those law professors coming out against Kavanaugh? I'll give you one guess. It's not just law schools, of course. Colleges are no better. Academia is, quite simply, broken. We'll save Hollywood for our next segment. Suffice it to say, our friends in Tinsel Tinseltown didn't distinguish themselves for their reason and moderation. While conservatives have been able to carve out an effective independent media presence and have been able to achieve political victory in elections, the chief cultural institutions of our nation are in the hands of leftists, radicals, who don't care about individual rights, or at least not the individual rights of those who disagree. In their pursuit of utopia, every person is either a tool or an obstacle. Now that Justice Kavanaugh is joining the Supreme Court, don't get complacent. Don't think the fight is over. It's just beginning. And now we know the stakes. Remember that on November 6th. Coming up, we check out the Hollywood stars taking on Brett Kavanaugh over the past week. Let's just say, I have some questions about their past. This week, celebrities took to the streets to protest the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. These celebrities are the finest America has to offer. Interpersonal saints, artists of heartbreaking genius, and they made the most of their moment in the sun to press forward their progressive vision for America, to decry the horrors of Judge Kavanaugh's supposed sexual brutality. Now, this is somewhat weird. Don't get me wrong. I'm all for higher standards of, in matters of sex. As a religious Jew, I was rather famously a virgin until my own marriage. But I have to admit, I'm kind of puzzled by Hollywood's sudden turn toward the traditional. I grew up in Hollywood. We actually filmed this show in LA. I have a number of good friends in the business. Suffice it to say, the city that brought the world the casting couch might not be the best source for moral guidance in politics. Boofing and the Devil's Triangle, as defined by Urban Dictionary, those are the least of the sins in this particular town. And it's particularly strange to watch as this particular coterie of celebrities climbs up on their pack of high horses to sneer at Brett Kavanaugh, a devout Catholic father of two who has been married for 14 years. Take Lena Dunham, for example. She showed up in Washington, D.C. to protest Kavanaugh. She tweeted, quote, so many women I love are in D.C. today. They represent hundreds, thousands, and millions of other women. At this point, opposing Kavanaugh is not about a political party. It's about ensuring that women, people of every political party, are safe. Lena Dunham, you may remember her from HBO, she wrote in her own book about sexually abusing her younger sister. Here's what she wrote, quote, as she grew, I took to bribing her for time and affection, one dollar and quarters if I could do her makeup like a motorcycle chick, three pieces of candy if I could kiss her on the lips for five seconds, whatever she wanted to watch on TV if she would just relax on me, basically anything a predator might do to woo a small suburban girl I was trying, unquote. That is the mild stuff from Lena Dunham's book. An actress named Emily Radajkowski claimed that she got herself arrested at the DC rally. She tweeted, today I was arrested protesting the Supreme Court nomination of Brett Kavanaugh, a man who has been accused by multiple women of sexual assault. Men who hurt women can no longer be placed in positions of power. You may not remember Radajkowski, but she actually got her big start starring with Robin Thicke in his controversial hit, Blurred Lines. But you're in The lyrics to that hit were deemed, quote, kind of rapey by many feminists. Why? Because here are the lyrics, quote, talk about getting blasted. I hate these blurred lines. I know you want it, but you're a good girl. The way you grab me, you must want to get nasty. Whoopi Goldberg showed up as well, and she had this to say on The View about Brett Kavanaugh. The message to women is, we're not listening. Yeah, That's yeah. the message. You're that's a far cry from Whoopi's comments on child molester Roman Polanski just a few years back. Polanski, you'll remember, fled the United States after being arrested for giving a 13-year-old girl champagne and quaaludes and then sexually assaulting her. Here was Whoopi's take on that fine gentleman a few years back. He was, was he charged not with? charged. I know it wasn't rape rape. 
They, I there was a statutory. Right? I, I, child molest, maybe. I'm I not think sure. It was, it was child something. Molest. It was something else, but I don't believe it was rape. Rape. And when we get all the information, somebody will tell me in my ear. All I'm trying to get you to understand mm -hmm. is when we're talking about what someone did and what they were charged with, we have to say what it actually was, okay, not so what we think it was. It wasn't rape, rape, according to Whoopi. But she's ready to destroy Brett Kavanaugh without any evidence at all. Whoopi's fellow panelist on The View, Joy Behar, was also fighting mad about Kavanaugh. The message to boys is, if you become a powerful man, you are allowed to grope a woman. So, if you become powerful, you get to grope women, according to Republicans. And also, according to Joy Behar, actually, it turns out she wasn't quite as angry when Al Franken was accused of sexually assaulting eight different women by grabbing them or trying to kiss them without their consent. In fact, she called Franken a gentleman and defended him fulsomely. Al Franken attacked, mm -hmm. was sort of attacked him verbally um, uh, at Jeff Sessions. Mm -hmm. He suddenly became the target uh, of the right wing to mm -hmm. get him out of office. Mm -hmm. And then um, Gillibrand, Gillibrand, is that her name? Mm -hmm. she, she was Kirsten. out to get yeah. him also. And, um, and the Democrats decided, oh, we're going to take the high road. Mm -hmm. And they basically lost a really good senator, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the way I saw that photograph where he was putting right. his hands, pretending to like touch them, which he didn't really touch them. Right. That was a sophomoric joke by a comedian uh, in a time when he didn't know he was going to become a senator. He was fooling around. He was a comic. Right. And to his credit, he said she didn't have any ability to consent. She had every right to feel violated by that photo. So he's a gentleman, and he took the hit. Right. And now can we please move on and get the um, great senator back okay. and get rid of the president? Can we just please move on? These are just some of the celebrities who traveled to D.C., but many more didn't, and they were far from silent. Matt Damon showed up on Saturday Night Live in an interminable 13-minute sketch to mock Kavanaugh as an angry nut. Let me tell you this. I'm going to start at an 11. I'm going to take it to about a 15 real quick. But you will recall that Matt Damon came under fire from Me Too, just last year for the great sin of recognizing a spectrum of bad behavior with regard to sexual misconduct. I think there's, I, th I do believe that, that there's a spectrum of behavior, right? And, mm -hmm. and we're going to have to figure out like what, you know, there's a, there's a difference between, you know, patting someone on the butt and rape or child molestation, <laughs> right? Both of those behaviors need to be confronted and eradicated without question, but they shouldn't be conflated. Damon was actually right, but he was forced to apologize. And now that he's bent the knee before the radicals of the Me Too movement, he's back in the good graces and ready to attack Judge Kavanaugh with the enthusiasm of the newly converted. And of course, Alyssa Milano famously showed up at Brett Kavanaugh's actual hearing and then bemoaned his nomination, stating that men should be held accountable even if they aren't exactly guilty. We will not be silenced any longer. And if that means that men have a hard time right now, then I'm sorry. This is the way the pendulum has to shift for us to have equality and, 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 and security in our country and within our societal views of what it means to be a woman. Weird, though, that Milano didn't seem quite all that upset about sexual misconduct by a Democrat back in 2012. Back then, she tweeted, quote, Bill Clinton, I love you so much, like crazy amounts of love. You remember Bill Clinton, soft southern accent, credibly accused of a brutal rape by Juanita Broderick. She says he raped her and then told her to put some ice on that. You remember Bill Clinton? That was the guy credibly accused of sexual assault by Kathleen Willey. She says he grabbed her in the Oval Office, forcibly kissed her, groped her breast, forced her hand onto his genitals. You remember Bill Clinton? Credibly accused of sexual assault by Paula Jones. She says he exposed himself to her and then told her to kiss it. Clinton paid her 850 grand to go away. Nice guy. Alyssa Milano loved him until she realized that she'd been called on it. This week, she determined that maybe, just maybe, Clinton should have been investigated too. How magically convenient. By the way, Alyssa Milano was actually on Meet the Press this week for her noted expertise in America's Pope, Jimmy Kimmel, sounded off against Kavanaugh as well. Hear me out on this. So Kavanaugh gets confirmed to the Supreme Court. Okay, well, in return, we get to cut that pesky penis of his off. I seem to remember someone else who had some trouble controlling himself around women. His name was Jimmy Kimmel. This game show is called Guess What's in My Pants. Now, <laughs> I've stuffed something in my pants, 
and you're allowed to feel around on the outside of the pants. You have 10 seconds to then guess what is in my pants. You ready? Set. Go. You should use two hands. Two hands. <laughs> now listen. True sexual misconduct should be called out by anyone and everyone. This isn't a call for Hollywood celebrities to double down on their own excesses or to justify the evil behavior of others. But it is a reminder that the sudden willingness to believe decades-old allegations against Brett Kavanaugh is kind of convenient from a group of people who gave Roman Polanski an Oscar and spent decades celebrating Harvey Weinstein. Coming up, I'm not done with Hollywood. Tom Arnold is here to discuss Justice Kavanaugh and his quest to uncover the holy grail of politics, President Trump's Russian P tape. Stay tuned. Live from America's News Headquarters, I'm Lauren Green. A horrific limousine crash leaves 20 people dead in upstate New York. Police say a stretch limo en route to a birthday party failed to stop and plowed into an unoccupied SUV parked across an intersection in a town about 170 miles north of New York City. All 18 people in the limo were killed, as were two nearby pedestrians. Local, state and federal officials are investigating. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo wrapping up his fourth visit to North Korea after another meeting with leader Kim Jong-un. Pompeo saying on Twitter that the U.S. and the North, quote, continue to make progress on agreements made at the Singapore summit. The pair also reportedly agreeing to hold a second Trump-Kim summit soon. Pompeo also stopped in Japan. He's now in Seoul, South Korea, and will wrap up his Asian tour in China. I'm Lauren Green. Now back to the Shapiro election special. the dressing room that elusive golden showers tape there's all sorts of video out there showing Trump as he really is so you got to get something for me yes I do oh my gosh this is real <laughs> actor and comedian Tom Arnold's new show on Viceland the hunt for the Trump tapes is being described as all the president's men meets curb your enthusiasm Tom Arnold joins me on the show. Thanks so much for stopping by. Man, it's an honor. Okay, it's an so, honor to be off Twitter and just here with you in person. Well, speaking of off Twitter, I have to ask you about a tweet that you sent about Brett Kavanaugh. We're going to okay. bring that up now because yeah, it's pretty yeah. controversial stuff. You tweeted yeah. a little bit earlier this week, alcoholism stunts your emotional growth. So if you start drinking alcoholically as a teenager, you stay a teenager emotionally until you deal with it. Explains a lot about Brett Kavanaugh from his combative behavior yesterday to his unusual bond with teenage girls' basketball teams. He's a 12-year federal judge. Yeah. You are a human being who is Tom Arnold. Yeah, but I'm alcoholic too. I'm an alcoholic, recovering alcoholic. And, uh, you know, I, 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 it was more about the way he, he conducted himself. I think, I think that something that gets lost in this, uh, there's a, a young woman that he referenced in his yearbook named Renata uh, Schroeder, and, and he referenced her. Dolphin, and there was yeah. a, the alumni club, and he referenced her, and, and she came forward, and, and all, he and his buddies all said they had sex with her. That was the, the Renata I love that club, and it's in his yearbook. And they all said they had sex with her, and he chanted stuff about her. And, and that's a, kind of a young guy. You, I don't know if you were in a fraternity, but that's a, what young guys do. I know, I know. That's why, that, that's <laughs> Look why at me, I'm here. dude. Look at Listen, me. I mean, come on. You're genuinely a good, nice young man. You genuinely well, are. I appreciate it. Thank and you. I, and, and that's why I'm here. But I, I, I went to the University of Iowa. I, all my roommates were in fraternities. That's, what, that's the, the sexual politics okay, that, of that. No, but understand this. Does it's that mean immaturity. you sexually assaulted somebody? That's it. No, no, no. I, I didn't say that. But there's an immaturity, and, and they go around and they say, that well, we all had sex with. Her. I mean, we should, but but think about this. Dude, that's why you kind of called him a child molester. No, 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 I did not kind of. Somebody, no. But I'm saying that's what they did to that woman, and she came forward. By the way, and spoke to and said they hurt. That if if you're if if someone said I had sex with Ben Shapiro uh, it, when you were in high school, I, and they all did a, a game around it, I mean, and they printed it. You would be that'd upset. be kind of a shock because yeah, but, you then, didn't know me in high school, dude. But then but then <laughs> they had got a, they were up for the Supreme Court. And you're sitting there, they had this, they Here's talked the about, anyway, they humiliated this young woman. That's something that so they So if did. you humiliated a girl in high school, your contention is that you shouldn't sit on the Supreme Court when you're 53. Yes, if you have not made amends to her, and you're sitting there, they're asking you questions about it, and, and you get surly because they're so asking for you, it's you not about Christine. So it's, for you, it's not about the Ford allegations. It's about what was in the yearbook? Well, it's about the, everything. It's about the lying. Do you, do it's you, about his attitude. Can, can I ask a simple question? Uh, but first of all, he should you, not be on the Supreme Court. Here's, I just, I, 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 day I, I, one with, here's Kevin. 
Larry Hickam Tom, from day one. Tom. Day one, he went out and read a statement that Donald Trump wrote Tom. for him. All Tom. these guys with Donald Trump. Dude. And it's like Donald Trump is a genius. He had, he did the most research of any president in the history. That's the problem with all these Trump guys. They read that statement from Donald Trump that kisses his butt, and, and they should, everybody should go. I, I, I have a question. Yeah. Okay. Are you a believe all women guy? Do you think that all women ought to be believed? In what way? If a woman comes forward with a sexual assault allegation, well, that's sexual always my first thing. Let me just say so my, does it, does it, my story. Does it, need to, does it need to be verified? Does, does, does what need to be verified? A, a sexual assault, sexual harassment well, allegation. Well, my, I, I, it's because personal to like me. a year ago, yeah. you suggested that Leanne Tweeden was coached to attack Al Franken. Oh, she was. I know Leanne Tweeden. No, 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 one hundred percent. I spoke to her the night before Al Franken resigned. I know her well. She was on my sports show, best that sports show period. One hundred percent. So you, you don't believe all women then? No, no. She was coached. Leanne Tweed was also a victim. Let me, let me say this, Ben. When I was a kid, I was raped from the ages of, of, five, of four to, to seven years old. And, and, and when, uh, when I got sober in 1989 and went to rehab, and you kind of get your, you start clearing stuff out and you start dealing with stuff like that. You make amends to people. You call the, the young woman in high school. You write her a letter. You say, listen, I'm sorry that we made fun of you, Renata Schroeder. We owe you an amends, which would have been what Kavanaugh should have done. But, but you, you go back and you start dealing with this thing that happened to you. And, and you, you write about it, and you, you decide whether you're going to confront the guy. And I went back to my old hometown to see the other kids that I grew up with to see if it also happened to them. And they didn't want to speak about it because they thought it was a gay. That thought that made us gay. And so, uh, but I was, my sister was arrested. She's uh, for federal drug crimes. And I was at her, at her trial, and a woman came up and said, I, my, I know who you're talking about because I talked about it in general. It's my brother-in-law that did it to you. And I know that because he also did it to his brother. And, and something like, I mean, that's a ter no, 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 I said, I have to find this guy. So I, I, I got a private eye, and I, I found him, and I went up, and I could uh, walked up to him at his place of business. He's a big church leader, a big businessman. It's a, it's a story. Yeah. You could Google it. And as I got up to him, all of a sudden, bam, I was back in that room. The trauma, I could smell the laundry outside of that room from tw okay. 25 years before. I'm saying the trauma is always there. You always feel it. You always remember it. And I confronted him, and I walked from there to the state capitol so, building. I went to Terry Branstad's office. He's a Republican governor of Iowa. Right now, he's an right. ambassador to China. I walked in there. I said, Terry, this guy's about to adopt his fourth son. You have to stop it immediately. He's like, that's a federal offense, Tom. I was yelling. I walked into the governor's mm -hmm. office yelling like these women are yelling. Yep. And they said, oh, you can't do it. But t two days later, his adoption fell through. Terry Brand said, help me, because, because I went into his office and also because And also because so, there so, were multiple verifiable cases, it sounds like. No, and this, no, 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 no. It you said there happened. were multiple Hold victims. On. Hold on. Dude, because that's why I you're believe... You're saying that... That's, 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 that's why you're I talking I believe about being people. raped from four to eight and equating that with the seven. yearbook entry. Four to no, seven. what I'm and saying is that's that why I believe entry. because I have a personal experience with it. But you don't believe all women. That's I the point that I'm making. I believe the first thing... Uh, that's why I tend to believe because it happened to me and I don't... And if people say, well, it's 30 years ago. I know you could feel it I tend to believe 30 that, years dude, ago. I, I, that's why I believe okay, people. So Tom, I that's was, my personal experience. I was brutally bullied in high school I don't, I, in terrible ways. Kavanaugh lied... And he's disgusting. And by the way, Trump appointed him. Trump lied. He's Trump has sexually assaulted women. He's harassed them. Trump he's is a liar. To the he is a liar. He he's a disgusting person. You, you don't want your children to watch him on TV. I want you to stand Tom, up and go. He should not be on TV. We gotta go. I wish we had more time. Okay. Because I think there's a lot to talk about here. But coming up next here on the Ben Shapiro election special on our All Star panel, we're going to take on several topics, including protesters who actually followed me to USC. I thought it well, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> On Sirius XM, your favorite shows on Channel 114. Plus, every story, every 15 minutes. Fox News headlines 24-7, Channel 115. And you're a Trump Republican, a Bush Republican, a McCain Republican, a Libertarian or a Vegetarian, you're pissed. I've never seen the Republican Party so unified as I do right now. That right there is Lindsey Graham 2.0, the best upgrade ever. Polls show Republicans getting a bump after the stunt the Democrats pulled on Brett Kavanaugh. And that's going to be the first topic for my panelists in tonight's rundown. Each topic gets one minute today. Clocks don't care about your feelings. Joining me today, senior producer at The Daily Signal, Kelsey Harkness, Fox News contributor and head of research at Bustle, Jessica Tarloff, and podcast host at The Daily Wire, the execrable Michael Knowles. He works with me, so I can say that. All right, <laughs> let's start. So... Guys, was it the right move for the GOP to confirm Kavanaugh? I'll start with you, Kelsey. 
Absolutely. If the GOP didn't confirm Kavanaugh, they would have set a very dangerous precedent in this country. Not just that, allegations not grounded in actual evidence or, or cooperation uh, can derail you from a, uh, from a seat on the Supreme Court, but also that it can ruin your entire life. Democrats absolutely overplayed their hands in this. We knew they were already motivated in the midterms. Republicans were in trouble. Now they're united like never before and fired up. They're going to you're going to see him at the polls. Now, Jessica, I know you disagree with this, obviously. So Only like 99% of it, <laughs> which is a rarity. Uh, the GOP certainly should have gotten Kavanaugh confirmed for their own interests and for what's going to happen in November. I think that enthusiasm gap bump is real and serious, and we have to hope as Democrats that they forget about this in the next 30 days or so. Um, in terms of what this means for America and the precedent that I think that it has set, I would encourage everyone to actually listen to Lisa Murkowski. I know everyone is loving Susan Collins, but I think Lisa Murkowski said some very powerful things about the importance of judicial temperament and faith in institutions. And I would also like to point out she is the only uh, GOP senator, female senator, who is a Repu who is a lawyer. Well, Michael, <laughs> I get to your opinion, but I don't care about it. But the next topic, I spoke this week at USC. A few hundred protesters actually showed up outside, which isn't surprising. That's usually how it goes. Our colleges are broken. One of the most insane stories, my favorite, this week, featured an attempt by USC students to get a USC professor, James Moore, fired for simply telling students that due process ought to apply to Brett Kavanaugh. At the University of Wisconsin, students launched a website called Make Them Scared UW with a list of unverified sexual abuse allegations against various students. So are college students really going to go along with the radical side of the Me Too movement? We'll start with you, Michael, since you didn't get any chance to speak last time, which was great, but we'll go to you this time. Wonderful, of course. Well, look at the example that's being set for them by Senate Democrats. Of course this is going to get worse. There are two problems here. One is the, the hookup culture. If the hookup culture is the 1960s free love, Me Too is the 1970s hangover. The other is a lack of civic education. So now we've had major rape hoaxes at universities, UVA, uh, Hofstra, all over the country, University of Wyoming, and yet we have more kangaroo courts, more campus tribunals. This has gone all the way up to Supreme Court confirmation hearings. Unfortunately, college students don't understand due process. They don't understand presumption of innocence. And I don't see either of those problems getting better in the near future. And Kelsey, what do you make of it? A lot of Americans don't realize that the country was quite divided on the Me Too movement prior to the Kavanaugh confirmation. Uh, only half of millennial women had faith in the movement. Clearly, women are even more divided now than ever. I think you're right that college students are uh, taking a more radical interpretation. That's only going to get worse. You're going to have a lot of fun in your future visits to college <laughs> campuses. On the other hand, <laughs> the Me Too movement is losing a lot of conservative women who wanted to be a part of it but cannot get on board with this radical interpretation of it. Well, coming back, we'll have more with our wonderful rundown panel. I work hard to protect this. So early on in the program, I said there was another story I liked the most. I lied. This is the best story, not only of today, but in human history. Three professors joined forces to perpetuate one of the great hoaxes of all time. They submitted 20 fake papers on topics ranging from heteronormativity at dog parks to fat bodybuilding <laughs> to a number of prestigious <laughs> academic journals. Seven of these were actually published. The authors concluded that grievance studies have politically biased standards. Shock and that deconstructionist ideas have essentially destroyed the liberal arts. So, are our universities savable? Let's ask our panel. We'll start with you, Jessica. They're totally savable. I am an ivory tower product myself, and I wouldn't have written any of those papers. I, I just, <laughs> I, and I listened to- They're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> they are crazy, and I was political science anyway, but I listen to conservatives sit around all the time complaining about this. Go out, get your degrees, get your PhD, you go and teach, you publish papers on the things that you think are important to talk about. I understand some of this sounds ridiculous, but this idea that our universities aren't educating people probably, I completely agree with what you're saying, that's more civics. Yeah. Um, but it seems, for all the power that conservatives have, certainly in America today, in politics, and across the board, a lot of money, why are you complaining all the time? Because they won't give us the PhD, seriously. They There's won't, an actual really? Yes, because the people who are uh, professors actually have to approve PhDs, and you're not going to get anyone to approve your dissertation about why the Second Amendment's a great idea, but I'll, I'll, I'll let our <laughs> Yale grad here talk to this. Yeah, that's like uh, the worst campus of all for these kind of crazy <laughs> things. It's true, they won't give you the PhD, and they won't give you tenure either, so it ends up going on and on and on. When I was at Yale, I actually uh, you had this blog where we would just use direct quotes from gender studies 
newspapers because they were so farcical, vegetarian, eco-feminisms, that kind of thing. That said, I think there is a lot of hope. There is a demand out there. If, if in the 1990s we had known that the right could take over media, could have a foothold in the mainstream media, we would have been shocked. Three years ago, if we knew that we could get these policy wins, these judicial wins, we would have been shocked. I think there's a demand. So you admit that conservatives aren't the victims here, and you guys are actually No, we are the victims, well. but we're going to fight back the against victim? the bullies, is what we're going to Hey, Kelsey, do. What, what, what's oh, yeah. your take? This is sort of an emperor has no clothes moment for universities and for these academic journals. This story uh, published by the Wall Street Journal, originally good investigation there. You don't know whether to laugh or cry while you're reading it. And I, I think that universities, if they're savable, they really need to take a hard look in the mirror. Um, we know over at Brown just a couple months ago in, uh, an article promoting a research paper about transgender ideology was pulled simply because certain people didn't like the end results of that study. Are they savable? I'm certainly a half glass full kind of girl, but I'm very worried and I think there's a lot of work to do. There's a big fight ahead. Well, we're not going to get to the last topic because I blew through the clock. That one's on me, guys. Yeah. <laughs> but coming up on our last segment for the night, a look at the reality of abortion and how polarizing an issue it actually is. Stay tuned. In all of the chaos regarding the nomination of Judge Brett Kavanaugh, we should remember one simple fact. If Kavanaugh were pro-choice, he would have been confirmed with 100 votes. He's clearly not an advocate for abortion, but Democrats didn't have the votes to stop him. So instead, Democrats decided to slander him as a gang rapist. Remember, Democratic opposition to Kavanaugh started not with Christine Blasey Ford, but with women in Handmaid's Tale outfits occupying the Senate confirmation hearing room and pro-abortion protesters being dragged out of the Senate Judiciary Committee. It's not a shock that Planned Parenthood, the organization responsible for hundreds of thousands of abortions per year, openly threatens senators in poetry. Quote, roses are red, violets are blue. Senators vote no on Kavanaugh or else we're coming for you. Hashtag National Poetry Day, hashtag Stop Kavanaugh. Now that's romance. Abortion, to the vast majority of the political left, is a sacrament. It's not merely a political issue. It is a defining character issue. If you are pro-abortion, you are a good, generous, decent person who values women. If you are pro-life, you are an evil, repressive, nasty person who wants to control women's bodies. It's that view that leads to incidents like this one, in which a pro-life advocate was kicked in the face by a pro-abortion nutcase this week. It's a baby. Yeah. It's someone who's raped and she gave birth and she decided to kill her three-year-old child. I meant to get your phone. The pro-abortion movement suggests that pro-lifers are extreme. In reality, the extreme position on abortion is held by the Democratic Party. Their platform calls for legal abortion all the way until point of birth. But pro-abortion extremists get away with their rhetoric because they use euphemistic language to describe what exactly abortion is. In fact, the word abortion is itself a euphemism. The procedure of abortion isn't an anodyne pollock removal. It involves doing terminal violence to an unborn child. Ignoring that fact allows abortion advocates to avoid looking reality directly in the face. So, for just a few moments, let's look reality in the face. This is a picture of a 19-week-old baby. This is a human child. This is not a ball of goo. This is not a cluster of cells. In January, 44 Democrats in the United States Senate voted not to protect the rights of babies older than this unborn child. Only three Democrats, Joe Manchin, Joe Donnelly, and Bob Casey, voted to protect children at 20 weeks. Only two Republicans voted against such protection, Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski. Take a good look at that baby. That is a human being with zero rights, according to the mainstream of the Democratic Party. And human life doesn't begin at 20 weeks. This is a picture of a baby at 12 weeks, barely three months. You can see this baby with his hands near his chest. This is not a cluster of cells. This is not a ball of goo. His genitalia have already been formed. His liver and spleen produce red blood cells. This is an unborn human being. Not a single federally elected Democrat would vote for an abortion ban that would protect this baby's life. And life doesn't begin at 14 weeks. This is a picture of an unborn human being at eight weeks. You can identify the head of this unborn human. You can see where the small buds are forming for arms and legs. But guess what? Life doesn't begin at eight weeks either. 
It begins at fertilization, when a new human life is formed, a new human being with its own DNA. This human being is not its mother, it is not its father, it is not a polyp. If we found a human embryo on another planet, the headlines would rightly scream, human life found on Mars. Human life is a continuous process of growth from the moment of fertilization onward. Abortion is the killing of this human life. The later the abortion takes place, the more brutal the procedure. But no matter the brutality of the procedure, it is obvious that abortion is not some mere optional surgery to be performed for convenience. And it's even more obvious that those who want to protect the lives of the unborn aren't trying to control women's bodies. Those who cherish abortion are trying to control and dismember the bodies of the unborn. Think about that next time you see a radical feminist in a handmaid's tail outfit suggesting that you'd better respect her right to carve apart an unborn baby in the womb or you're some sort of fascist. No more euphemisms. Thanks for watching. I'll be back next Sunday for my final election special. Steve Hilton is coming up next. So early on in the program, I said there was another story I liked the most. I lied. This is the best story, not only of today, but in human history. Three professors joined forces to perpetuate one of the great hoaxes of all time. They submitted 20 fake papers on topics ranging from heteronormativity at dog parks to fat bodybuilding <laughs> to a number of prestigious <laughs> academic journals. Seven of these were actually published. The authors concluded that grievance studies have politically biased standards. Shock and that deconstructionist ideas have essentially destroyed the liberal arts. So, are our universities savable? Let's ask our panel. We'll start with you, Jessica. They're totally savable. I am an ivory tower product myself, and I wouldn't have written any of those papers. I, I just, <laughs> I, and I listened. They're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> they are crazy, and I was political science anyway. But I listen to conservatives sit around all the time complaining about this. Go out, get your degree.